Radio 4, it's two minutes past three. And now we present Alibi for a Judge by Felicity Douglas and Henry Cecil with Basil Dawson. From the book by Henry Cecil and starring the late Andrew Cruikshank as Mr Justice Carstairs. Alibi for a Judge. Sorry, I'm late. I was held up in the court. And Mrs Burford? Yes. How do you do? How do you do? The prison waiting room is not the most inviting of places, but I'm anxious to clear up several points, and it did seem essential to talk to you and your husband before I defend the case in court. I imagine Mr Hunt, your solicitor, explained that to you. Yes, I did. <clears throat> Unusual, but necessary, under the circumstances. But why have you dragged Leslie along? I didn't want this. I don't mind, darling, if I can help. We must hope that you can, Mrs Burford. Oh, sit down, please, Mr. Burford. It's not going to be easy, is it? Well, frankly, no. But William didn't rob the bank. He didn't steal the money. He didn't blow open the safe. It was... Leslie, darling, please let Mr. Empton speak. He's trying to help us. No. Let us look at this from the point of view of the prosecution. You, as a man with a previous conviction... Surely will the not... jury won't know that. But they might guess because we will not be able to say your husband's a man of good character. Why not? Because of my conviction. <laughs> my photographs are in the Rhodes Gallery, all right. But that was 15 years ago. What about his war record? William was a commando, and he got the MC. Do shut up, Leslie. That would only be helpful on sentence. Sentence? If um, it should come to that. I'd like to hear about him, Mr. Burford. Oh, it was one of those raids on the north coast of France. He had to raid a German GHQ, dispose of a couple of sentries, get past the guardroom and into the ops room. It wasn't much, really. Not much. Think of the danger. And they blew open the safe. Leslie. Not very helpful under the circumstances. Uh, it would go against me, wouldn't it? Mm -hmm. I bet Thompson was counting on that. Thompson. You still say it was this man Thompson who planted the evidence on you? Of course. Unfortunately, we have only your word for it. There is no trace of him whatsoever. Trust him for that. Mm -hmm. At this scarf which the police discovered, you don't deny that it was yours? How can I? It was found in my flat and it had my initials on it. And a quantity of dust from the room in the bank where the safe was blown. Now, you contend that the scarf was taken away by Thompson, mm -hmm. who must have brought it back and hidden it under the sofa the evening after the robbery, when he also brought you round fifty pounds in unused five-pound notes, which subsequently proved to have come from the bank. Thompson's been so damn clever. What grudge has he got against you? None, why? When the informer rang the police, he said, About that bank robbery yesterday, you'll go to William Burford's flat, you'll find some of the notes there. He's got a record, too. I told him I'd get even with him the dirty so-and-so. Don't you see? That was Thompson playing the part of an informer. He knows that if they got me, they'd stop looking for him. The speaker had a strong Australian accent. Well, he lived there for a bit, and he's a good mimic. Always has been. <laughs> I remember when we were kids at school, he was you always... Were... You were at school together? Yes. Why on earth didn't you say so before? I... Well, does it matter? This at least proves he existed. Of course he exists. There may even be some record. Old Boys Association, school magazine. This will be of a great assistance. We'll get in touch with the school at once. But, oh, just a minute. What? It's a mistake. A mistake? Yes, 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 it was uh, a, a mistake. Uh, I, uh, we, uh, I wasn't at school with Thompson. Uh, what I mean, uh, what I meant was that I'd known him since my school days. Rather an odd mistake. Oh, come on, this is important. I'm sorry. Please forget what I said about the school. Where were you at school? I, I forget. You forget. Really? I'm sorry, Mr. Hunt. I'm wasting my time. I quite understand. Don't mm. go. Please don't go. I know you don't believe us, but you're our only hope. I'll tell you where he was at school. He was at Hayworth. Oh, my God. I'm sorry, darling. I had to tell him. Mr. Empton, I don't want you to go to the school. Forget that I said anything about it. After all, I'm paying you. 
I can't force you to explain, as you say, you're the client. But I warn you, you're making a grave mistake. And you're not furthering your case at all. I know. Well, to continue this wild goose chase, you have known this character Thompson since you were boys. Yes. You've kept up with him off and on. And about six months ago, you met him again on a race course. Yes. It was my birthday, and we'd mm. gone to the Brighton races together. Mm -hmm. And after this, you saw quite a lot of him. Yes. He used to drop in nearly every week. He never gave you his address? No, he didn't. He always rang us. Can you describe him to me? He's tall and fair with blue eyes. He looks rather like William. That's why the police identified him. Of course. It's true. Thompson and I have been taken for each other since we were boys together. Since you were boys together, but not schoolboys together, hmm? Yes. What does he do for a living? He's a crook. Is he? I suppose he told you that. It's obvious, isn't it? Those notes he gave to William were some of the stolen ones. Mr. Burford, you first told the police that he gave you the notes as a present. That isn't true, is it? Well, it is and it isn't. Either it is or it isn't. Were they a present or not? They were. William had been putting on bets for him, big ones. He'd had some good wins, and he said he'd like William to cash in. That's right, and I told the superintendent that the second time. Why didn't you tell him the first time? Well, I, I, I don't know. I should have, but when the police came round, I was scared. Now tell me about this previous conviction. I got a legacy from an aunt and went into the second-hand car racket. His partner turned out to be crooked. He got five years. William only got six months. I was a sucker. My conviction was for receiving stolen goods. Oh, the same could have applied to the notes, couldn't it? Only if you knew they were stolen. I... Well, I'd read about the bank robbery, and he gave them to me the night after. When I saw the copper, I lost my head. And lied? In a way, yes. You also lied about your whereabouts on the night of the robbery. You told the police you went out for a walk alone to meet a man who didn't turn up. That was Thompson. But the second time they called, you said you'd made a mistake and you were in bed with your wife. I was. Why not go and look for him? For whom? Thompson, of course. Mrs. Burford, I am talking about your husband's alibi. And I'm talking about Thompson. Why not go and look for Where, him? Where, for goodness sake? On a race course. What a practical suggestion. Or to revert to this alibi, if I may... Are you sure you were in that night? Positive. If you're so positive, why did you lie the first time the police questioned you? Uh, I made a mistake the first time. I, I got muddled over the days. Mm. And you, Mrs. Burford, can you bear this out? I'll say whatever you want me to say. Mrs. Burford. Well, why not? William didn't do it. And all I want is to get him off. If saying he was in bed with me instead of out for a walk will do it, of course I'll say it. What wife wouldn't lie for her husband? You're prepared to commit perjury? Of course. I love William. But if you can think of a better story... Well, at least she's frank about it. Why? What have I said? Don't you understand? Tell me what to say. Anything you think will help. There will be no need for you to say anything. Why not? In view of what you have just said, I won't be able to call you. Not call me? As a witness, you mean? Well, who's going to give William an alibi if I don't? Don't you see, darling? They know you're lying. You told them so. They're only guessing that I am. That's it, isn't it? It doesn't make sense. Mrs. Burford, you must allow Mr. Empton to be the best judge of how to conduct the case. And what about Thompson? Aren't you going to do anything about him, either? Certainly, if you will allow us to go to your husband's school and verify his existence. No! In that case, there is nothing more I can say. If you Mr. won't find him, I will. If you continue to interrupt me, I must ask you to leave. No need to ask. I'm going. This is a waste of my time and yours. I'll find him. Then they'll have to believe us. Goodbye, William, darling. It's going to be all right. Oh, lawyer. I'm afraid Leslie's a little bit lacking in tact. She certainly hasn't helped your case. 
Look, I couldn't call her to tell a story that she's admitted as a lie. She isn't telling a lie as it happens. I was at home that night. Yes, of course. In any case, I don't think your wife will make a very safe witness. She'd certainly contradict the judge if she felt like it. Oh, who is the judge, by the way? Do you know yet? Mr. Justice Carstairs. What's he like? Will I get a fair trial? In this country, everyone gets a fair trial. God bless the establishment. That is the third time you have asked that question, Mr. Bell. I'm very sorry, my lord. Uh, pray don't apologise, Mr. Bell. I was thinking of the jury. Uh, some of them, no doubt, are very busy people. Yes, quite so, my lord. Uh, now, Superintendent Neal, you told us that you had been called to the bank, learnt that the safe had been blown, and a lot of money taken. Then someone telephoned you, and as a result, you went to see the prisoner. Yes, sir. You proceeded to question him about his movements at the time of the robbery, and he told you that he'd been out for a walk alone to meet a man who never turned up. Yes, sir. What happened next? I asked him how he accounted for the five-pound notes in his possession, notes which proved to have come from the bank. And what did he say? He said they had been given to him by a man named Thompson. Where did this Thompson live? He didn't know. Where could he be found? He couldn't say. You're sure it was Thompson, he said, not Brown or Jones? No, Thompson, my ah, lord. Ah, Thompson. Another man who hasn't turned up. <laughs> Just so. Thank you, Superintendent. Uh, do you wish to cross-examine, Miss Lenton? If you please, my lord. <clears throat> Superintendent Neal. You've been a CID officer for many years. Yes, sir. And in the course of your experience, you have come across many types of suspects. Certainly, sir. And, speaking generally, haven't you found that people are nervous of being questioned by the police? I have noticed it, sir. Some of them have guilty consciences, perhaps. Yes, my lord. Uh, but even those without guilty consciences are sometimes nervous. Why should they be? I've never understood this objection by innocent people to being questioned by the police. I shouldn't mind in the least being questioned by a police officer. I was referring to ordinary mortals, my lord. <laughs> the natural tendency is to think, now what have I done? Speaking as a motorist, I know that's how I feel. Perhaps <laughs> with good reason, Mr. Anton. Very kind of your lordship. Now, superintendent, at the second interview with my client, you told him the notes and dust from his scarf had been identified as coming from the bank. Yes, sir. And he told you that Thompson had given him the notes for help which he'd given Thompson at the races. What sort of help? Oh, he didn't say, my lord. Fifty pounds for unspecifiable help from untraceable Thompson. Mm -hmm. What about the dust on his scarf? How did he account for that? He said Thompson must have put it there. Ah. With a pepper pot? <laughs> uh, yes, go on, Mr. Lampton. Thank you, my lord. Now, Superintendent, I understand you and your officers searched the bank premises carefully. Yes, sir. And you found nothing there to connect my client with the robbery? No, sir. Exactly. So, apart from his statements to you, all you have against my client is the dust and money which he explained. Well, what about the identification of the accused by Police Constable Griffin, Mr. Empton, just after the robbery? And that was not by the superintendent, my lord. No, of course it wasn't, but he was present at the identification parade, were you not, superintendent? Yes, my lord. The jury may think that of some materiality. Oh, dear, oh, dear, oh, dear. Oh, now, dear. Superintendent, I want to ask you about the accused's statements. When you first saw him and asked him where he was at the time of the robbery, he said he was out by himself. Yes, sir. But on the second occasion, he said he'd made a mistake about the day and that he was in bed with his wife. Yes, sir. And he added that his wife would confirm it. The wife was present at the time? Yes, my lord. Did she seem fond of the accused? Very, my lord. Quite so. Superintendent, I take it your wife is very fond of you. Does that mean she would lie for you? You need not answer that question, Superintendent. Uh, no re-examination, my lord. I'll call Police Constable Griffin. Uh, this is my last witness, my lord. 
And uh, that is the case for the prosecution, my lord. I'll call the prisoner, my lord. We're going to the witness box, please, Mr. Burford. Fire up. Take the book in your right hand and repeat the words on the card. I swear by Almighty God that the evidence I shall give shall be the truth. The whole truth and nothing but the truth. You are William Burford of 15B Marcus Road, Northwest 6, and you are an insurance salesman. Yes. Uh, does your wife work? Part-time in a boutique in Knightsbridge. And you are happily married, I believe. Very. Are you and your wife both content to live on your present income? Yes. Now, Mr. Burford, as you know, well, as we all know, £80,000 in unused £5 notes were stolen from the City and Counties Bank between 11 and 11.30 on the night of the 23rd of May. Where were you at the time? In bed with my wife. How? How do you remember that? Because I've thought it over. Mm -hmm. I made a mistake about the date the first time. But when the superintendent called again, I told him I was in bed with Leslie. Where did you get the five-pound notes? They were given to me by Thompson. Ah, this mysterious fellow Thompson. Can you describe him? He's about my height and looks a little like me, my lord. I see. So the policeman Griffin may have mistaken him for you. I suppose so. But does anyone else in the world except you and Mr. Thompson think you are both alike? Certainly, my lord. When we were at... When we were boys, people used to comment on it. Any of them here today? No, my lord. No one except you. You're sure Mr. Thompson isn't there too? In the box with you? Certainly not, my lord. He's disappeared. Most unfortunate. Yes, Mr. Ranton. Hmm? Oh, I, I beg your pardon, my lord. I wasn't aware your lordship had finished your cross-examination. Mr. Ranton, behave yourself. Go on. Why did Thompson give you 50 pounds? I used to help him place bets at race meetings. Why couldn't he do it himself? Secrecy, my lord. There seems to be a good deal of secrecy about Mr. Thompson. I cannot for the life of me think why bets have to be placed in secret on a race course. There's nothing illegal about it. If I may say so, my lord, your lordship appears to know very little about racing. I am completely ignorant of the subject. Then... If I may say so, my lord, it seems a pity that you should appear to cast doubts on the truth of what my client is saying. I merely said I saw no reason for secrecy when placing bets on the race course, and I still see no reason. Now let's get on. May I explain, my lord? There are more important things for you to explain than the habits of the racing fraternity. I submit, my lord, that my client should be allowed to explain. Oh, very well. Tell the jury why bets have to be placed in secret if you think it will help. It sometimes affects the price if bookmakers know that a particular person is backing a horse. I see. Do I understand that you pretended to bookmakers that you were backing a horse when in fact it was Thompson? And when less favourable odds would have been obtained if the truth had been known? Something like that, my lord. It seems most dishonest to me. Well, I suppose it's not as bad as robbing a bank. My lord, I must protest at that observation, and I ask for a new trial before a fresh jury. Well, certainly not. Go on with your cross-examination. <clears throat> Mr. Burford, look at the jury, please. Did you or did you not participate in any way in the bank robbery on the night of May the 23rd? I did not. Thank you. Mr. Burford. Now, Burford, you maintain the vanishing Thompson robbed the bank. I suppose so. And at the time you were in bed with your wife. I suppose so. I suppose so, don't you know? I was in bed at 11, but I don't know what time he robbed the bank. Oh, I'm obliged to you for the correction. You merely assumed he was the thief because he presented you with the notes. Yes. And the dust? Did he present you with that, too? He must have. You didn't lend him your scarf, by any chance? No, my lord. Then how did the dust get there? It 
must have taken the scarf without me knowing. Very unfortunate for you. Like the policeman identifying you. I have already said that Thompson and I are alike. Oh, yes, you said so. Thank you. Do you wish to be examined, Mr. Lynch? Uh, no, thank you, my lord. Your next witness, please. That is the case for the defence, my lord. Oh, no other witnesses? No, my lord. But I thought your client's wife confirmed his story to the superintendent. No other witnesses, my lord. Oh, very well. Do you think it is necessary to address the jury, Mr. Uh, thank Bell? You, no, my lord. Mr. Lampton, I imagine you would like to address the jury. If you'll not, you please. Mm -hmm. Members of the jury, I am not going to pretend that this is an easy case. But there is one important fact which I am sure you will not have overlooked. The alleged identification. Seven days before the identification parade at 11 o'clock at night, in the dark, at the scene of the crime, the witness P.C. Griffin saw a man running with his back to him. He submitted that he could not see what the man was wearing, and yet he claims to have recognized my client from one quick backward glance. Now, obviously, this witness could not have been sure of himself. Mr. Rampton, you mustn't mislead the jury. It is for them to say whether the witness was sure of himself. And it will be my duty to tell them so in due course. Perhaps your lordship would prefer it if I sat down, then you can tell them at once. Well, that is the most improper way to talk to me. I apologize, my lord, but it is rather difficult to address the jury if your lordship is addressing them at the same time. I shall not say another word, however much you may seek to mislead them. Pray continue. On the contrary, my lord, I pray you to continue. I shall rely entirely for the rest of my submission on the fairness of your lordship summing up. Mm. <clears throat> well, members of the jury, before I deal with the law and the facts, there is one matter to which I must draw your attention. We are told that at the time of the robbery, Mr. Burford was in bed with his wife. But where is she? She is alleged to have confirmed the prisoner's story to the police. But she is not a witness. What you have to ask yourself, members of the jury, is... Why not? Why not? But I want to be a witness! Silence! Uh, one moment. Is that your client's wife, Mr. Renton? Uh, ye yes, yes, my lord. Uh, let the prisoner's wife be accommodated with a seat in the well of the court where she would have been had she given evidence. But I want to give evidence now. But I understand her to say that she wishes to give evidence at this late stage. Is that what you said, Mrs. Murphy? Yes, my lord. Do you wish to call her, Mr. Renton? May I um, uh, take instruction on that, my lord? You may. There's nothing Mr. to talk about. I want to give evidence. Mrs. Burford, you must remain silent and leave matters in the hands of your husband's learned and able counsel. Well, Mr. Rampton? I should like to call Mrs. Burford. Do you make a formal application for leave to call her? Yes, my lord. Your application is refused. That's not fair. Mrs. Burford, if you wish to remain in court, you must keep silent. But I want to speak for my husband. You I... should have been called at the proper time. I can't help it if I wasn't. I want to speak now, and you've no right to stop me. You must not address me like that. And I can assure you that I have every right to refuse counsel's application. No other judge in England would have granted it at this stage. But it's not fair. It isn't justice. I want to tell the jury Mrs. Burford, for the last time, do you or do you not want to remain in court? Yes, I do, but then I... Then be seated and be silent. But I only want to say that I saw... Be quiet, madam. If you utter one word more, I shall have no alternative but to commit you to prison for contempt of court. Sit down, Leslie. He means it. You can't do any more. Oh. Silence! Members of the jury, there is a story well known in the legal profession about a judge who, when he came to deal with a certain prisoner's defence, simply turned to the jury and gave a long, low whistle. But much as I am tempted to take the same course in this case, it would not be right for me to do so. 
Let me first of all say it, it is not for the accused to prove his innocence, but for the prosecution to prove his guilt. Counsel for the prosecution submits that it has been done. Mr. Empton contends that it has not. It is for you, and you alone, to say which of them is right. Members of the jury, are you agreed upon your verdict? We are. Do you find the prisoner, William Burford, guilty or not guilty? Guilty. Guilty. And that is the verdict of you all? Yes. Members of the jury, I entirely agree with your verdict. I nearly said not guilty, but you were so damned unfair. What did you say? No, nothing. Now, what did the juryman say? My lord, he said... He said... Yes, yes, yes. I nearly said not guilty because you were so... Uh, unfair. What is your name? You, sir, I am speaking to you. Stand up. What is your name? Honeyman, my lord. That was a most improper observation. Uh, yes, my lord. You agree? Yes, my lord. Do you wish to express your regret? Uh, yes, my lord, for having said it. Uh, uh, very well. I could send you to prison for contempt, but in view of your apology, uh, I shall overlook the matter. Thank you, my lord. Call the officer in charge of the case, please. Now, what about his previous conviction? <clears throat> Fifteen years ago, the prisoner served a sentence of six months for conspiracy to steal and receive motor cars. What were the circumstances? He went into the second-hand car trade and got mixed up with some highly undesirable characters. Not Mr. Thompson again. <laughs> Any chance? <laughs> I don't think so, my lord. As far as it is known, the prisoner has gone straight since then, until this present offence. Anything else? Uh, the prisoner has a distinguished war record and was awarded the military cross. Mr. Renton? No. Thank you. Mr. Hampton, do you wish to say anything in mitigation? Yes, my lord. I would ask you to disregard his previous conviction, which was of a different kind and which my client has lived down. I would also ask you to take into consideration his war record. I believe you had a good war record yourself, Mr. Hampton. But so far as I know, you have not broken into any banks. A very charitable assumption, my lord. You call upon the prisoner. William Burford... You have been convicted of felony. Have you anything to say why sentence should not be passed on you according to law? I didn't do it. I may have behaved stupidly when the police called, but once you've been in prison, you get scared of policemen. Thompson's the man who did this and not me. You don't believe he exists, but I swear he does. And the jury would have believed it if you'd given me a fair trial. Quite right. Silence. Silence. William Burford... I shall disregard your thoroughly improper remark. I shall also disregard your previous conviction. But you have now been convicted on the clearest evidence of a very grave crime. It must be made known to all persons who contemplate this sort of crime that the punishment must inevitably be severe. In spite of your gallant war record, you will go to prison for ten years. Ten years! Be up standing in court. All manner of persons having anything to do before my lords, the Queen's Justices of Oya and Termina, and general jail delivery of the Central Criminal Court may depart heads. God save the Queen. Do you call this justice? Why didn't you let me speak? This is Burford. Silence! Thompson does exist, and I can prove it. I saw him yesterday. Mrs. Burford, please, this won't help your husband. Oh, it's all your fault. Hmm? Why didn't you call me? I told you I'd found Thompson. You knew I'd been searching for weeks. Why wouldn't you let me tell the judge? He didn't believe in Thompson, but if he did, it would have made all the difference. Talk about English justice. It's all so bloody unfair. Juryman calls judge unfair. You've seen tonight's paper, Ernest? I wasn't unfair. Not to the juryman. No, sir, not to the juryman. But I was to the prisoner. If you say so, sir. I don't. 
Ernest, you've been my clerk now for a good many years. You know me. How was I unfair? For one thing, you were dead wrong about the racing. It's quite normal for someone in the know to put bets through someone else. It's common practice. He was charged with robbing a bank, not a racing swindle. But it isn't a swindle. And you made it look like one. A man might easily be paid fifty pounds for helping to place large bets if they were successful. But that can't have made any difference to the verdict. No. What was the wife calling out as I left the court? She said she'd spent weeks looking for the man Thompson, and uh, yesterday she saw him. Uh, that's what I thought. She wanted you to know. Seemed to think it would have made a difference. It certainly would. If she was speaking the truth. Oh, I say it if it wasn't true. And I turned down Mr. Empton's application to call her. But I couldn't do anything else, could I? Not that stage. No judge would have allowed it. Why on earth didn't he call her at the proper time? I expect he had good reason. If he knew she was a liar, for example. Oh, possibly. But if the jury had heard her story about Thompson, they might have acquitted. If they believed that Thompson existed at all. I never gave them a chance to believe in him. Which means the wretched Burford's got ten years for something he very possibly didn't do. I shouldn't worry, sir. It was a fair verdict. But not a fair trial. As fair as most of yours. Oh, I... I'm very sorry, sir. Is that what everyone says? Most people, I'm afraid. The right, of course. Why do you do it, sir? I can't help it. They say that to know one's faults is the first step to curing them, but there never was a bigger fallacy. I know my faults, but I can't cure them. Can't? I don't think I haven't tried. Every time I go into court, I tell myself I'm going to behave today. For, 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 for a time, I usually do. Then something starts me off, and there I am, conducting the case for one side or the other. As long as you choose the right side, why worry? It's not my job to choose either side. For heaven's sake, Ernest, wouldn't you worry if you were in my place? I don't know. But I think if I were the kind of judge who interfered, it, it wouldn't worry me. And if I were the kind of man who worried, I wouldn't be an interfering judge. You're lucky I'm both. The trouble is, I have an overwhelming desire that right should prevail. I can't bear wrong decisions. Uh, have you ever tried a case where a jury's given a wrong decision? I don't think so. Until today. No, 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 sir, I don't agree. Today's decision was the right one. And even if it wasn't, worrying won't help. There's nothing you can do about it now. Oh, isn't there? Good evening, You'll wait and see. Mr. Empton, sir. Oh, thank you, Ernest. Uh, uh, Tommy, good. Uh, Shelley? Yes, please. I think you owe me a round dozen after your behaviour in court. Is Bell coming over? No, no, he's sent his apologies. He has a conference. Well, he has no objection to our discussing the case, if that's what you want. It is. You're Shelley. Oh, thank you. I want to talk about your appeal. I you think the sentence might be reduced? To hell with sentence. Get the conviction quashed. <laughs> Burford's not appealing against conviction. Not if it takes my advice. You're absolutely astounding. Well, you're astounding me a bit. After the way you let me walk into the application to call Mrs. Burford and then turn me down flat. Oh, yes, I'm sorry about that. Not that I expected the application to be allowed. It was, it was just the way you did it. I've said I'm sorry. Now, now, listen, Tommy. Hmm? Of course he's going to appeal. On what grounds? The fact that the trial was conducted unfairly from start to finish. Well, I'm damned. Unfairly from start to finish. But I, I couldn't possibly put that in my appeal. Why not? It wasn't any different from any other trial I've had before you. Well, never mind the other trials. I'm only concerned with this one. You can rely on my interventions, for one thing. But you were entitled to intervene. Then I made a rather unfortunate remark, and you asked for a new trial before a fresh jury, and I refused it. So would any other judge. Tommy, I am trying to help you. D do you mean that if I put all that into a notice of appeal, your note to the court would support it? I mean exactly that. <laughs> I'm serious, you know. <laughs> Now, now, another point. It was right to refuse your leave to call the wife. 
but not without exercising my discretion. Uh, you did exercise your discretion. Oh, I, you, I didn't. I rejected your application out of hand. I didn't even let you argue about it. Yes, but what on earth could I have said at that stage? It doesn't matter what you could have said. The point is, I didn't let you. Then Ernest tells me I was wrong about the racing. God heavens, that's entirely irrelevant. You're making me work very hard. What at? The fact that all these little things, when added up, amount to an unfair trial. Yes, but will the Court of Criminal Appeal agree? There's nothing like enough for them. Don't think so. No. Ha, 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 ha. What? Well, then, what about the way I kept looking at the jury? How on earth could I put that in an appeal? Why not? For one thing, it's not in the shorthand notes of the trial. That's true. Let me think. <laughs> yes, I've got it. I'll take this down. No, no, no. No, 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 far no, enough. no. No, no, come along. All right. If it'll make you happy. Now, hmm. from time to time, um. the judge looked at the jury... In a manner which plainly told them that the accused's story was not to be believed, thereby usurping the jury's function. Hmm? And uh, at the end, I could quote what that juryman said. Well, what the juryman said has nothing to do with it. It's I who am saying it. And I'm going to put it all in my note to the court. You are not, because I'm not going to appeal. Well, don't you want your client to get off? Naturally, but I'm not going to make a fool of myself in the court of criminal appeal by telling them that I don't like the expression on your face. And there isn't a hope of bringing it off. The only result would be that the wretched Burford served an extra three months waiting for the appeal to be heard. Uh, oh, don't look so worried, Gerald. Even if you were a bit unfair. The verdict would have been the same whoever sat on the bench. Not necessarily. In view of what the wife called out about Thompson as I was leaving... I shouldn't take anything she said too seriously. That's why I didn't call her. I found her unreliable. But why say that about Thompson when it was too late? Well, if that's all you're worrying about, forget it. I have no intention of forgetting it. And if you won't appeal, there's only one thing I can do. There's nothing you can do. You know, Gerald, you're not thinking straight. You need a holiday. Thank God the vacation starts next week. Yeah, Cynthia and I are going to Greece. Why not come with us? You've been overdoing things since Molly died. You're seeing this case out of proportion. I see nothing out of proportion. I'm perfectly sane. Or as sane as I ever am. Are any of us judges sane when you come to think of it? We sit up there pontificating and making rude remarks and sending people to prison. And how often do any of us look at ourselves and say... Aren't you overdoing it a bit? Well, I have looked at myself and I don't like what I see. If you won't appeal, then you won't. So, there's only one thing for it. I shall go to the Home Secretary. Home Secretary? But you can't do that. Why not? You'll want to know why there was no appeal, for one thing. I'll tell him. Even so, If I shall. tell him the trial was unfair, what more could he want? You know, it's all very well for you to eat your words, but there's no need to make such a hearty meal of them. Next time, be a bit more unfair. Then you might give the poor Home Secretary a sporting chance. No good, Tommy. I am determined to have the case reinvestigated. Even if it means finding out what the wife was getting at. And how do you propose to do that? By asking her, of course. Good morning, Mr. Burford. Morning, Mr. Hunt. Good of you to come. We are only too pleased to meet here, Sir Gerald. I think perhaps Miss Burford doesn't agree. I don't. I can't see any point in it. I hope you will in a minute. Please sit down. <laughs> Mr Hunt, do you mind if I ask Mr Burford some questions? On what subject, Sir Gerald? There is only one subject we're all interested in, as far as I know. Uh, yes, of course. Mrs. Burford, when you told me after the trial that you had seen Thompson, were you telling the truth? What difference does it make? Nobody believes me. Uh, please answer the question. The judge is trying to help you. The way he helped William? I think I should tell you that in the absence of an appeal by your husband, I went to see the Home Secretary. Sir Gerald! What can the Home Secretary do? If he were satisfied there had been a miscarriage of justice, he could order your husband to be released. And he's going to do that? No. Then why tell me about it? I told you, Mr Hunt, he only wanted to torture me. On the contrary, I've been trying to help you. 
Unfortunately, the Home Secretary didn't consider the trial unsatisfactory enough. That wasn't your fault. Mrs. Burford, please. Now, there is a good deal of truth in what Mrs. Burford says. What did you say? The Home Secretary refuses to do anything without fresh evidence. What's the good of fresh evidence if nobody believes it? The jury might have believed it if they'd heard it. Are you trying to say you've changed your mind about William? I am trying to find out whether you were telling the truth about Thompson. If you could prove that Thompson does exist, that would, in my opinion, be enough to make the Home Secretary act. What do you want me to do? Answer some questions. And then? And then I shall try to decide whether you are telling the truth or not. All right. Where did you see Thompson? Kempton Park Races. Are you in the habit of going to race meetings without your husband? No. Where did you go last week? To look for Thompson. No one else would. To look for one man among thousands? I knew exactly where he'd be. Where? By the tote paying out window in Tattersall's. Where? Whose side are you really on? If you can convince me that you saw Thompson, I shall tell the Home Secretary immediately. Why did you look for Thompson near the tote? Because he goes there to buy winning tickets. <laughs> Presumably everybody wants to do that. No, I mean when the race is over. He buys uncashed winning tickets for more than they're worth and then sells them to shady businessmen. What on earth for? So that they can account for money paid into their bank accounts without having to pay tax on it. You see, they send up all the tickets and the tote people send them back a cheque. You don't pay tax on winning bets, do you? A swindle, in fact. Only swindling the tax man. Everyone does that, don't they? <coughs> no, perhaps not everyone. Mrs. Burford, how do you know about this? Because William helped him once or twice. You admit that your husband took part in this swindle? He didn't realise it was a swindle until afterwards. Are you now claiming that's why Thompson gave him £50? Yes. Why didn't your husband tell me this? Because he'd already told the police he'd got the money for placing bets. When the superintendent first called, William thought it was because they'd got onto the tote ticket racket. I know he lied about it, but what else could he do? He'd had a conviction already. You must see how bad it would have looked. Uh, <laughs> you do believe me, don't you? Uh, it's an odd story to tell if it's not true. But don't you see she's just... <laughs> yes, Mr Hunt. Uh, nothing, Mr Gerald. You say that you saw Thompson on a race course. I did see him. Didn't it occur to you that you need an independent witness to the identification? Of course. Then why didn't you fetch a policeman? I did. What happened? Nothing. By the time I'd found one and got back to the tote, Thompson had gone. Did you take the policeman's number? No. Why didn't you ask someone to watch Thompson while you looked for the policeman? Have you ever tried going up to a perfect stranger on a race course and saying, watch that man? Hmm. What is his full name? His full name? Yes. Why do you want to know? Because the police will need it. Police? They'll have to find the man. The Home Secretary will want proof of his existence, apart from your words. But if I gave you a full description... Mrs Burford, you may not know it, but a great deal of police information is derived from informers. I certainly do know it. Thompson informed on William. Very well, then. It's no good the police questioning informers about a, a George Albert Thompson if the man we want is Geoffrey Arthur Thompson. I see. Why do you hesitate? Don't you know his full name? Or have you forgotten it? Or doesn't it exist? It exists, all right. He had two rather odd Christian names. William says he used to be teased about them when he was a boy. What were they? Cedric Mattingly. Uh, well, that is a curious combination. Cedric Mattingly Thompson. No, not Thompson. Not Thompson? No. His real name is Wilson. Oh, really? Then uh, why does he call himself Thompson? Why does any crook change his name? If this is true, I cannot understand why your husband didn't say it in court. Uh, I suppose he thought it didn't much matter what the man was called, as nobody believed he existed. But he could have said it to Mr Empton or to me. Well, you never believed anything, he said. Really, Mrs Burford, that simply is not true. Isn't it? Oh, I suppose he didn't tell you for the same reason he didn't mention the tote tickets. Yet you tell us now. Nothing Mrs. Bertha tells us now can make things worse for her husband. Thank you. Cedric Mattingly Wilson, alias Thompson. You accept this story, Sir Gerald? 
Why on earth should Mrs. Burford make it up? If it isn't true. But can't you see... Yes, Mr. Hunt. Nothing. Anything more you want to say before I ring up the home office? You're going to do it? Now, what was the name of that race course? Kempton Park. Kempton Park. <laughs> yes, sir. I ring from my study. Kempton Park. Kempton Park. Mr. Hunt, don't you want the judge to help me? If you're telling the truth. I know what you think. But everything I've said this morning was true. Including that business about the names? Why should I make up a story like that? That's what the judge said. What you hoped he'd say. You took a long time to answer a simple question. You needed a convincing explanation. It convinced the judge anyway. I ought to warn you, Mrs. Burford, that if you mislead the judge and expenses incurred as a result, you may get into serious trouble. What kind of trouble? It might amount to an offence. Might amount to an offence? What do I have to do to stop it being an offence? Go on, tell me. Surely you don't want me to break the law. As a matter of fact, subject to anything Sir Gerald might say, it's not at all an easy point, but I would be rather inclined to say that if a person tells lies to the police or someone like that, and in consequence, public expenses incurred, then if that happens, and if it's done deliberately or maliciously or recklessly, I'm not quite sure about that... Then, subject to anything Sir Gerald might say, in almost any of those cases, it might amount to an offence. Thank you. That's perfectly clear. What does the Home Office think the police are for? They can't spur the men to go hunting for a man whose existence... whose existence... Whose existence is, to say the least, doubtful. It's very good of you to have tried, Sir Gerald. We won't take up any more of your valuable time. Does that mean you can't help any more? I don't see what more I can do. Oh, I suppose I can go on looking for him myself. If I do see him again, what should I do? You'd need a witness to the identification. And even if you found a policeman in time, it might not be easy for you to persuade him. Supposing Mr Hunt came with me? That would be very expensive and... Uh, I'm not quite sure what I could actually do. You must hire a private detective. I can't. The defence took all our savings. But, Sir Gerald, apart from the expense, would it serve any useful purpose? A private detective could only witness the identification of a man who Mrs Burford said was Thompson. True enough. If only the judge could come with me. Mrs Burford. Me? Why not? Any policeman would do what a judge told him. But, my dear Mrs Burford, I couldn't possibly. Why not? Who ever heard of a judge going racing with the wife of a man he had just sent to prison? Can't judges ever do anything unexpected? The whole idea is out of the question. Mr Hunt, are you married? Married? Well, yes, I am. Supposing the judge had sent you to prison for cooking one of your client's books. Oh, that is a most improper suggestion. And supposing you were really innocent and the only way to prove it was for the judge to go racing with your wife. Would you still object? In that particular hypothetical case, I, I, I really could not say, but I, I, I suppose... You see? Oh, I wish I understood lawyers. You seem to think that justice can only be done by dressing up in 18th century wigs in a courtroom. Here's a perfectly simple way of righting a wrong, and you won't even consider it. Just because it's never been done before. Dr. Johnson expressed it rather neatly. The antiquity of abuse is no justification for its continuance. Mr. Hunt, I would like to take your client to Brighton Races tomorrow. Have you any objection? But I warn you, Mrs. Burford, I know nothing whatever about racing. <laughs> Gerald arrived? No, miss. The train may be late, race week. Oh, dear. 
Wish we could have found a better room for him. If you want a better room in Doncaster, first week in September, you must book ahead. I suppose so. Oh, you won't forget to bring the whiskey when he arrives. I don't never forget now. No, I'm sure you don't. Then why ask? What about that drink for my wife? I can't do everything at once. Darling, did you hear what she said? Shh. Well, you know who she is. Yes, yes, I do. And she's certainly most attractive. So you think so, too. There's been quite a lot of talk about them. So Gerald Carstairs is an absolute charmer. <laughs> At a cocktail party, maybe. But when you're on your feet before him in court, no. I do hope there isn't going to be a nasty scandal. Do you? Someone saw them lunching together in August, and I hear they've been going round to race meetings the whole vacation. And now he considers himself an expert. I wonder if it really is fresh evidence he's after. <sighs> what rubbish you women talk. And for goodness sake, don't go telling all your friends about his being here. Of course not, as if I would. Only your train <laughs> hadn't been late, Sir Gerald. How are you, Judge? Ah, uh, Candle. How are you? Well, I didn't know you patronised this sort of entertainment, Judge. Oh, uh, do you know my wife? How do you do? How do you do? May I introduce Mrs... Uh, it's, it's nice to see you again. Uh, how do you do? Were you uh, racing today? No, I am vacation judge, but I am racing tomorrow. No, oh, I've been told to back um, Persian Prime for the big race. What do you think, Judge? Uh, can he win? Well, I suppose any horse can win if all the others faint or fall down. <laughs> uh, that is the one horse which can't. You can't win the St. Ledger with sprinting blood on the sire's side. I had no idea you were such an expert. Oh, it's a comparatively new interest. What uh, What are you backing? I don't bet, but Zoroaster will win. You back it. He knows what he's talking about. Thank you, I will. Mm, Zoroaster, it's, uh, it's pretty short odds. Better a short-priced winner than a long-priced loser. <laughs> <laughs> and if all you judges take to the turf, the bookmakers will be driven out of business. Good night, Judge. Good night. Good night, Sir Gerald. Good night. Good night, Mrs. Bathurst. She knew my name. Most unfortunate. Who are they? George Campbell and his wife. He's a barrister, a member of my own inn, as a matter of fact. I'm sorry. I wonder what they'll make of it. Don't worry. Come and sit down. You look tired. <laughs> I am rather. These vacation courts can be exhausting. I've been dealing with a very tiresome, voluble woman. As bad as I would have been? <laughs> I doubt if that would be possible. Were you fair? Or did you give one of your favourite looks? No, I remembered your William and behaved like the personification of justice. Blind and dumb. <laughs> it was an awful strain. Oh, poor dear. Uh, it was nice of you to have got me a room. Oh, not at all. Uh, but I had a bit of bother. The town's packed. Fortunately, I got friendly with the receptionist. It's a beastly little room, but at least it's got a private bathroom. Uh, it's only for one night. It's a nuisance that Thompson has gone up to his room. Yes. He was in the bar downstairs until an hour ago. If only your train hadn't been so late. We'll get up early and confront him before breakfast. We'll do nothing of the sort. We'll see him now. Now? Why not? If he's gone to bed. He can get up again. Leslie, are you sure this is the man? Of course I am. I never let him out of my sight from the moment I first saw him. How did you manage to send the telegram? I tipped the barman. Isn't it exciting? <laughs> I'm beginning to believe it is. Excuse me, sir. Yes? Inspector Martin's still waiting. Inspector? Are you ready to see him? Of course. Why didn't you tell me he was here? I did. Oh, well, was it someone else I uh, told? Please you? ask him to come up. I've been rushed off my feet all night. When did you get hold of the police? My clerk rang them from London. It's awfully late to do anything tonight. Why don't we ask the inspector to come back in the morning? Inspector Martin, ah, sir. Uh, sorry to have kept you waiting, Inspector. That's all right, sir. Good of you to come along. My clerk explained to you what it's all about. I understood it was a matter of identification to do with Burford, the bank robber. Uh, this is Mrs. Burford, uh, the uh, uh, bank robber's wife. Uh, evening, madam. And Mrs. Burford says that the man Thompson is staying at this hotel. I see. What exactly do you wish me to do, sir? I'd like you to be present when she identifies him. Uh, what's his room number? Seven. Would you ring for the porter? He's probably asleep by now. Uh, uh, the porter? No, Thompson. Oh, if he is, he can get up. Please ring the bell, Leslie. I, I think it would be better to wait till the morning. And sit up all night in case he should disappear again. I don't mind sitting up. If Mr. Thompson is in room seven, we are going to see him now. Oh, please ring, Leslie. <sighs> what, uh... 
What if he refuses to see us, sir? Why should he, if he's innocent? I can think of some perfectly respectable people who'd be very angry if they're woken up in the middle of the night. We'll meet that situation when it arises. Now, Inspector, once you have witnessed the identification, I would like you to question the man. Hmm, Is there any evidence against him, sir? You shall see that when you question him. I'm sorry, sir. I don't like it. Why not? If he's innocent, he'll come to no harm. If he was a party to the robbery, you are perfectly entitled to question him. But he's not bound to answer. Inspector, you don't appear to be particularly anxious to help. I don't know, sir. It could be very embarrassing. Here's a strange man in room seven. We have only Mrs. Burford's word for it that he's the so-called Thompson. I believe Mrs. Burford's telling the truth. You rang for me, sir. Uh, Tell Mr. Thompson in room seven I wish to speak to him. Warren. Mr. Charles Warren is in room seven, sir. Mrs. Burford, it may interest you to know that the occupant of room seven is a Mr. Charles Warren. I know. Not Wilson, not Thompson, but Warren. He probably uses all sorts of names. After the trial, he'd never call himself Thompson again. True enough. Porter, will you ask the gentleman in room seven to join us? Say, I know it's an unusual request. Perhaps you'd better mention my name. I'd better go along too, sir. No need. What do you mean, no need? What I say. What do you say? There's nobody in room seven. Gentleman checked out at nine o'clock. He can't have. He has, you know. I'd just come on. First job I did tonight, called him a taxi and took out his bag. I see. What did he look like? Well... He was tall and fair with blue eyes, wasn't he? He might have been, but then again he mightn't. Can't expect me to remember things like that. Rushed off my feet all night. You're sure you can remember this man leaving? I shouldn't have said I could if I couldn't, should I? Thank you, Inspector. I'm afraid I've troubled you for nothing. I'm very sorry. That's all right, sir. It's, uh, it's been a pleasure. Good night. What time is the next train to London? 11.40. You've missed it. There's another at a quarter to two. Gets in at half past five. You can't sit up in a train all night. I could, but I don't propose to. 8.23 in the morning's favourite. That'll do very well. I should like to be called at seven. Good night. Room 16, seven o'clock call. You won't be wanting tea. Goodbye, Mrs Burford. We shan't be meeting again. Please don't go. There's nothing more to be said. I presume you had an object in dragging me up here overnight. But I am not interested in hearing it. I tell you, Thompson was here. If only your train hadn't been so late. This is Burford. During the last six weeks, you have, on three separate occasions, claimed to have seen Thompson. There is a limit to my credulity. The other times it was sheer bad luck that you didn't happen to be with me. But tonight... I just can't understand why he suddenly changed his mind and left. I swear he didn't see me. That statement, at least, I am prepared to believe. But he was here. I was watching. I... I even saw him leave. What? I saw him leave. And there was nothing I could do to stop him. Why didn't you tell me this as soon as I arrived? I couldn't. I was afraid you wouldn't give me a chance to explain thought you'd catch the next train back to London. I certainly would have. You see, I thought if only I could keep you here, I could talk to you, explain everything, convince you that... You have already convinced me that you are incapable of telling the truth. You don't understand. I'm admitting that I didn't tell the truth at first. But doesn't that prove that I'm telling... It proves nothing. You told me he was in room seven. That was untrue. You were surprised when you heard he'd left. That was false. Now you tell me you saw him leave and expect me to believe it. The porter saw him too. The porter saw a man called Warren. But Warren is Thompson. I told you. You told me after I told you. I swear it's true. You swear too much. I can't altogether blame you for thinking you can take me in with almost any story. But I don't propose to listen to any more of them. Thompson does not exist. And never has existed. Then why should I pretend he does? What would I get out of it? About a hundred pounds of my money, to begin with. That was for expenses. I can account for every penny. Can you? Good night, Miss Burford. Good night. Who is that? 
Mrs. Burford. What do you mean by coming to my room like this in the middle of the night? I found out why he left. Go away at once. You said we wouldn't be seeing each other again. I meant it. Then you've got to listen to me now. I told you I don't want to hear any more of your lies. You must. They aren't lies. I've got a witness. You know that blonde receptionist? I certainly do not. I told you about her. Her name is Rita. I've just been talking to her. That's quite untrue. I made a telephone call earlier and the manager answered. There is no receptionist on duty. Rita lives in. I went up to her room. She's a snooty little thing. I had to give her five pounds before she agreed to talk. But it was worth it. Why should you want her to talk? Because I remembered she'd been friendly with Thompson. At least he'd been trying to get friendly with her. And I thought she might have some idea why he left in such a hurry. He didn't leave because he was never here. He left because he found out you were coming. What? He was hanging about reception. And he heard the manager tell the housekeeper to make sure Sir Gerald Carstairs' room was properly aired. When he realised you were coming tonight, he asked for his bill and went straight up to Pat. Why on earth should he? I wouldn't have known him. I've never seen him before in my life. How do you know? He might have been up before you under some other name. And you couldn't have helped noticing how like William he is. Mrs Burford, you are not only the most habitual liar I have ever met, you are also the most persistent. Now go back to your room or I shall ring the bell and have you turned out. All right, if you don't believe me, we'll call Rita. She'll tell you. Oh, 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 put it down. You can't leave from my room at this same night. Uh, hello? Uh, yeah, yes, yes, I, I got my city number, thank you. Good night. All right, I'll get her to come along and talk to you. You'll do nothing but kind. One of you is more than enough. Now go back to your room and stay there. Will you talk to Rita in the morning? What is the point? All she can tell me is that a man left the hotel. But you can't give up now. Please, dear, kind Sir Gerald. If you give up now, there's no hope for William. I can't manage alone. <laughs> oh, oh. Oh, there. There. You, you mustn't take on, sir. You will go on helping, won't you? You're our only hope. Come along now, Leslie. You must try to pull yourself together. Sit up. I, I beg you. Sit up. Please. Please. Oh. All right. If this girl confirms your story, and if you do find Thompson again, ring me up at once, and I'll telephone the police and try to persuade them to help. That's the best I can do. Bless you. You're an angel. But only if you go away now at once. And, and don't let anyone see you. Don't worry. Sleep well. Uh. 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 Goodness gracious. Hello? No, I don't want to call. Have you got a girl on your staff called Rita? You have? Good. Ask her to come and see me, will you? No, no, not now. In the dining room in the morning. Uh, thank you. Good night. Uh. Uh. I told you to go away. Go away, Mrs. Burford. I'll see you in the morning. Gerald! Who's that? It's me, Tommy Empton. Tommy? Hmm. Good heavens, what are you doing here? When did you get back from Greece? This morning. I came up to try and stop you making a fool of yourself. What? If it's not too late. Ernest told me all about this little escapade. Well, then I presume he told you I came here because Thompson was here. Unfortunately, he left before I arrived. I bet he did. And you believe this story? Well, I admit that Leslie... Is... Oh, so it's Leslie now, is it? Uh, Mrs. Burford doesn't always tell the truth. About this time, she has a witness, the receptionist. I wonder how much you paid her. Five pounds. Oh. Oh. You mean she might have bribed the girl to support her story? Of course it's possible, but I don't think it's likely. Why not? Because none of her lies make sense unless Thompson really does exist. You mean Wilson? What do you know about Wilson? Ernest told me that, too. Does the name matter? It certainly does. 
on the way up here, I called at Hayworth. Hayworth? Hayworth. Burford's old school, not far off the A1. What about it? Burford once claimed that he and Thompson were at school together. You didn't mention it at the trial. Well, I couldn't. Burford wouldn't have it. Extraordinary. That's what I thought. Well, obviously, if Thompson or Wilson exists, his name would be in the school record. So, just to satisfy myself, I called in. And did you find anything? Yes. William Burford and Cedric Mattingly Wilson were in the same house. So he does exist. Wait a minute. I saw his name in the school records, all right. What did I tell but you? But I also saw it on the Roll of Honor, killed in action in 1944. Oh, no. Oh, yes. Oh, dear. But, Gerald, you can't prosecute a woman for blackmailing you before she's actually done so. Not a blackmail. Obtaining money by false pretenses. By pretending to search for a man she knew to be dead. Have you thought of the publicity? I have. It'll be most unpleasant, but I can see no alternative. Well, I can. Let well alone. You were acting for the best possible motives. Why should you suffer for it? After all, she hasn't got away with much. The defence of, that was only a little one, has never appealed to me. And she should be prosecuted in the public interest. Gerald, um, is that the only reason you're doing this? Ah. Uh. No, damn it, it isn't. I really put myself out for that girl. At first, I was only concerned with having been unfair at the trial, but gradually I grew to believe in her. I grew fond of her, too. Oh, so not in the way you think. I'm sorry for her. And all the time she was laughing up her sleeve at me, lying and deceiving me. Next time, she may get someone into real trouble. Publicity or not, she's not safe at large. All the same, I should let sleeping bitches lie. But I wouldn't. Ah, uh, that'll be the superintendent. The director of public prosecution wants to have the whole story in detail before starting proceedings. The whole story? I've told him everything that I consider relevant. Superintendent Neal, sir. Good afternoon, sir. Ah, uh, ah. Uh. Uh, good afternoon, Superintendent. Do you remember Superintendent Neal, Tommy? Yes, of course. How are you, Superintendent? Superintendent? I've got an appointment at Chambers. I'll come back when I've finished. No need if you're busy. Every need, in my opinion. Now, Gerald, don't commit yourself until I've had another chat with you. I take it you will be briefing me. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> good day, Superintendent. Sir? Oh, do sit down, Superintendent. Ah, thank you, sir. Has the director briefed you? His office got in touch, sir, and put me in the picture. If you could just fill in the details. Of course. Now, um, you first sent for Mrs. Burford, uh, when was it, sir? About a week after the trial. It must have been early August. And uh, after that? We went to several race meetings together. About how many? Three or four? Mm, more like six or seven. And... <clears throat> You always went alone with her? Yes. So uh, you went to about half a dozen race meetings alone with the young woman? Yes. <laughs> if you can ever be alone at a race meeting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. How did you go, sir? By train or by car? Sometimes by one, sometimes the other. And you always lunch together, sir? Naturally. <clears throat> ah, but um, you've never been to this young woman's flat, have you, sir? If you'll pardon my asking. I don't apologise, Superintendent. It's a perfectly natural question. The answer is no. I've dropped her there, of course, but I've never been inside. And she has never been here? Alone, that is? No. No. Oh, yes. Yes, once. We'd driven up from Newmarket, and she wanted to arrange to meet a friend. She came in to ring up. Ah. To ring up. And then she went to wash. Ah. To wash. Surely there's nothing odd in a girl going to wash. Oh, no, sir, quite natural, as you might say, but <clears throat> if you were alone in the flat, <clears throat> we may be dealing with an unscrupulous woman and... Uh... <clears throat> well, look, do have a lozenge. Well, what for, sir? For your throat. There's nothing wrong with my throat, sir. A telegram for you, sir? Oh, excuse me, Superintendent. Of course, sir. All right, Ernest, there's no answer. Sir? From Miss Burford. 
It's coming here at four o'clock. Oh, well, there are still one or two points I'd like to clear up, so if you'd let me know when it's convenient... Well, you can't go now, Superintendent. You'll be here in ten minutes. Uh, yes, sir, but until you definitely decide to prosecute, it might be less embarrassing to talk to her without a police witness being present. Well, certainly not. I intend to prosecute, and I insist that you stay. If you want me to, sir. Uh, but I'm sure you know the sort of thing to expect. She may allege anything, absolutely. <clears throat> anything. Such as? You'll forgive me, sir. We're both men of the world, and she may suggest, she may imply that... Uh... That we've slept together. If that's what you mean, for heaven's sake, say so. Of course, I know it wouldn't be true, but it's just word against word, and often difficult to refute. And uh, people do sleep together. I'm perfectly well aware of that. Uh, mind you, in your case, no one will believe it. I mean, fortunately, you've never stayed under the same roof. <laughs> I'm afraid we have. You have? Uh, when was that, sir? Last night, the Golden Hind at Doncaster. She sent a telegram to say Thompson was staying there. Yes, I heard about that, but you didn't stay all night. You drove back with Mr. Empton. I don't expect your room was anywhere near Mrs. Burford. I have no idea where hers was. Anyway, she was never in your room, and you were never in hers. <laughs> As a matter of fact... <coughs> yes, sir? She did come to my room. Last night? Yes. Oh, you you hadn't asked Mrs. Burford to... Uh, no, of course uh, not. She came in after I'd gone to bed. Uh, gone to bed, sir? So you weren't both fully dressed? On the contrary, we were both fully undressed. Uh, you mean... I mean that I was in my pyjamas and she was in a dressing gown. I see, sir. Um, forgive me, but did uh, <clears throat> anything take place between you? Of course it did. If a woman came to your bedroom, you wouldn't just lie doing nothing, would you? Something would happen, wouldn't it? Even if it was only that you told her to get out, as I did. You told her to get out, and she went? No, I told her to get out, and she stayed. So you rang the bell and had her turned out? I threatened to, but she... <laughs> she, she seemed upset. Uh, upset? She, uh, she threw herself on my chest. Your chest? Sir. You heard what I said, didn't you? If only she wasn't so good-looking... This is most unfortunate. These women are the very devil. What are you getting at? <clears throat> I was only wondering if, in the circumstances, you wanted to prosecute. I've talked to the director and we've decided it's the proper course. And you've told him all you've told me? Uh, not uh, quite all. I didn't mention the episode in the bedroom. I don't like it. It looks so premeditated getting you to go up there on a false pretext. You think her purpose was blackmail? Well, that or revenge. In either case, it could be very unpleasant. Uh, strange to think she's a criminal type. She's got such a sweet face. And in many ways, she's such a nice creature, such a kind, thoughtful... <laughs> you won't go, Superintendent. Not on your life, sir. Mrs. Burford is here, sir. I know. Uh, send her in earnest. It's not going to be easy, sir. If Mrs. Burford runs true to type, she will employ one of two methods. And if it's the hellcat no holds barred business, it may be embarrassing. And the alternative? The poor, helpless little girl didn't mean any harm game. I needn't tell you which is the most dangerous, sir. No, you needn't. This way, please. Mrs. Burford, sir. Would you be a darling and ask Ernest to pay my taxi? I've run out of change. Ernest. Yes, sir. What on earth happened? Did you go by car last night? You left without even talking to Rita. Oh. You remember a superintendent, Neil? I most certainly do. What is it? William's all right, isn't he? He hasn't tried to escape or anything silly? No. Thank heaven. I've some wonderful news for you. When I found out you'd gone this morning, I had a new idea. A new idea about Wilson? Yes. I thought, as he'd been so friendly with Rita, she... Who is Rita? A receptionist at the Golden Hind. I see. And uh, Thompson, or Wilson, was friendly with her? Yes. So I thought she might know where he was planning to go next. And she did. I'm afraid it cost another fiver. No doubt. But it'll be the last one. He's going to sand down tomorrow. So if the superintendent comes with me to the tote paying out window, he'll be in the bag. What is it? Yesterday, Mr. Lampton drove up to fetch me at Doncaster. Oh, I see. That's why... On he... the way, he visited your husband's old school. He saw the role of honour. 
He's not really dead, you know. This is too much. (laughs) Mrs. Burford, I think I should now warn you that you needn't say anything unless you wish to do so, but that anything you say may be given in evidence if you are charged with an offence. What offence? Obtaining money by false pretenses from Sir Gerald Carstairs. What false pretenses? By falsely pretending that Wilson was alive when in fact you knew him to be dead. I wasn't pretending. He is alive. Really, Mrs. Burford? Mr. Fenton saw his name on the school roll of honour. Are you suggesting you are speaking of a different man of the same name? No, that's the one. Perhaps it would interest you to know that I have already applied to the War Office for formal confirmation of his death. I see. Well, they'll confirm it all right. Is it not a fact that you have often told Sir Gerald you've seen this man and that he's given you money on the strength of it? We all know he's dead. Now, why keep up the pretense? It's not a pretense. Can you explain why he's officially dead? As it happens, I can. But what's the point? You won't believe me. What is the reason? When Wilson turned up again, about two years ago, William was amazed because he'd seen his name on the school roll of honour. He said so. Wilson laughed. Cedric Mattingly, Wilson is dead, all right, he said. My name's Thompson now. And he told us how he'd found a dead soldier and changed identity discs. He was up to his eyes in debt and in trouble with some girl. It seemed too good to miss. Then he got taken prisoner. And at the end of the war, he started life again as Thompson. So you see. That's a very old story. And it's not as easy to bring off as you make it sound. It is, in fact, almost impossible to get away with. There are no authentic cases on record. If someone got away with it, the case wouldn't be on record, would it? (laughs) Why didn't your husband tell this story at his trial? How could he? His only defence was Thompson. And this story would have proved Thompson was dead. But after the trial, when Sir Gerald tried to help you, why didn't you tell him? Because he was helping me. You were our only hope, Sir Gerald. If I'd told you, you'd have gone to the war office and they'd have told you Wilson was dead. You wouldn't have taken my word against the official records, would you? I'm telling you the truth now. And you don't believe me, do you? How can I? You lied to Mr. Remton, you lied to the police and to Mr. Hunt. You've lied to me at least twice and probably a great deal more. How can you expect anyone to believe this fantastic story? It may be fantastic, but it's true. Oh, I know William and I were foolish. I know we told lies, but those aren't crimes, are they? And now I'm going to prison too. That's where your help's landed me. Not that I care much with William in prison, only it's so cruel. He's doing ten years for something he never did. And I'm going to be arrested for something I never did. Can't you see how unjust it is? And you're supposed to represent justice. Were you ever on the stage, Mrs. Burford? Oh! I would like you to come with me and sign a statement to the effect of all you've just said. You needn't if you don't want to. Oh, what does it matter? I'll sign it. Can I go and do my face first? I don't want to go looking like this. Don't worry. I won't run away. (sighs) I think we can say that was pretty satisfactory, sir. I suppose so. I can't help wondering why she sticks to her story. Mm. If you were a police officer, you wouldn't, sir. But what is she to gain from it? If you ask me, she knows just what she's doing. That was a very pretty exhibition that she put on just now. I suppose it couldn't have been genuine. That old identity disc from a dead soldier yarn? I only hope she'll have the sense to tell the truth when she's a time and to think it over. I shouldn't count on it, sir. That young woman's no fool. She can still make a lot of that bedroom business if she wants to. Oh, no, 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 you're wrong there. If she had wanted to use that as a piece of blackmail, she would have mentioned it by now. I hope you're right, sir. <clears throat> I'm sorry I made a fool of myself. I'm quite ready if you are, Mr. Neal. Very well. Mrs. Burford. Before you leave here, I should tell the whole truth, if I were you. If you bring out some further bombshell later on, you mustn't be surprised if people don't believe you. No, there's nothing else. Thompson planted it on William, and he isn't dead. That's all there is to it. Well, let's get going. I'm sorry it's all gone wrong. So am I. But not for the same reason. Goodbye, sir. I'll ring tomorrow. Goodbye. I nearly forgot. I lost an earring yesterday. I suppose you 
didn't find it in your bed, did you? If only I could remember whether she was really wearing earrings. After what she said yesterday, what difference does it make? And if she wasn't, then she certainly does mean business. But if she was, she might genuinely have lost one. She used the words, in your bed. Whether it's blackmail or revenge or, or, or just plain mischief, it's perfectly clear what she's up to. It's not clear at all. I think you should drop the prosecution. This woman pretends a man is alive in order to get money out of me. It's a simple case of fraud. She should be prosecuted. If she cares to make absurd allegations. You do believe they're absurd, don't you? Well, of course I believe it, but the whole story is bound to come out. Sensation, judge and convict's wife in hotel bedroom. Are you suggesting I should let the fear of publicity put me off? Yes. For the sake of the profession, if not for yourself. Uh... What would I tell the director of prosecution? Tell him you've changed your mind. I, I, I couldn't do that. Could I? Isn't it better than having to resign? Nobody can make me resign. If I choose to resign, that's my business. Nobody can make me. Gerald, don't underestimate the pressure of public opinion. I could almost write the leaders myself. How can a judge try a case impartially if a pretty girl can make him lose his head so easily? Well, the fact that she's pretty has nothing to do with it. I'm not so sure. Would you have found her so convincing if she'd been plain? Uh, suppose I do drop the prosecution. <laughs> yes? There's nothing to stop her blackmailing me later on. And if she really is a blackmailer and I drop the case now, she'll know I'm frightened and she's on firm ground. <laughs> oh, if only I could remember about those earrings. Uh, what is it, Ernest? Sorry to intrude, sir, but the chief would be grateful if you'd sit in the Court of Criminal Appeal on Thursday... I've uh, brought you a little lot of papers. All right. Leave them on the desk here. Oh, and uh, Superintendent Neil rang up. Neil? Why didn't you put him through? He couldn't wait, sir. He, he's coming round. He said something extraordinary has happened. Something extraordinary? Yes. Didn't you ask what? I didn't like to. Anyway, he, he rang off. Sounded in a hurry. Where was he ringing from? I don't know, sir. Are you sure he said extraordinary? Yes, sir. All right, Ernest, you needn't wait. Sir. And something... Something extraordinary. What could he mean? Tommy, mm -hmm. you don't think she started something already? But would that be so extraordinary? Unfortunate, perhaps, but hardly surprising. Perhaps he meant unfortunate. People are notoriously slipshod in their choice of words. I'm always having to comment on it, even to cancel. Thank you. <laughs> a police officer might easily say extraordinary when he meant unfortunate. Why can't people be more precise? <laughs> oh, good Lord, that might mean. No, no there wouldn't be time for that yet. But what precisely are you talking about? A petition for divorce. Oh, that's ridiculous. Well, why? Uh, suppose there were a conspiracy between the Burfords. A judge sends a man to prison so that he can run off with his wife. <laughs> David and Uriah, the Hittite. <laughs> it, all, it all depends on the earrings, doesn't it? If that remark was a deliberate warning, why shouldn't he try it on? After all, she wasn't my bedroom. But not in your bed. Then what did he mean by something extraordinary? Well, it's no use making guesses. We shall know in a minute. If only I could remember about those damned earrings. One thing is certain. If I ever get out of this, I shall go straight for the rest of my life. They all say that. In this case, it will be true. Never a sound until my judgment. Never an unfair word or look. I shall hold you to that. Extraordinary. Unfortunate. Which did he mean? Sir Gerald! Good afternoon, sir. What is this all about, Superintendent? It's not for me to say, sir, but I feel we owe Mrs. Burford an apology. To hell with apologies. Tell them what's happened. Now, what's happened is that we've got Leonard. Who? I'm sorry, sir. You didn't know, of course. Uh, that's what he's calling himself now. Leonard. Alias Warren, alias Thompson, alias Wilson, was picked up at Sandown Park Races this afternoon as a result of information received from Mrs. Burford. Information I got from Rita and you paid for. Good heavens. They can't all be the same man. Well, they are, sir. We've searched his flat and found 30,000 of the stolen notes in the fridge. As soon as he realised it was hopeless, he agreed to make a statement. But I don't understand. I mean, Wilson is dead. I saw his He's name. He's not, you know. 
But you yourself said the war office would confirm his death. I know, sir. She thought they would, but they didn't. Far from it. He was discharged from the army with an indifferent character in 1946. When did you learn this? From the war office this morning. So I rang up Mrs. Burford and asked her to accompany me. And there I was being whisked off to stand down in a Z car. Imagine it. My dear Leslie, I am so glad. But what about the school roll of honour? Oh, that. He wrote to the school himself, pretending to be a relative and announcing his own death. But surely they checked. Why should they? They just accepted it. Exit Wilson, enter Thompson. I'm not sending my boy to that school. And then he sold us that identity disc story. And like fools, we bought it. I told you it was a very old story. Why tell it? Well, as long as we believed he was officially listed as dead, we were helpless. We could have proved he was at school with William, but where would that have got us? A dead man can't rob a bank. Extraordinary. Precisely. I'll wait for Mrs. Burford in the car. I'll let the director know. He'll be pleased. Speaking for myself, I know I am. I always felt sure Mrs. Burford was speaking the truth. What a nerve. Aren't the police different when they're on your side? You know, I, I feel I must apologise too, Mrs. Burford. I'm sorry I mistrusted you so much. I knew you never believed anything I said after that interview. It was so difficult to know when you were telling the truth and when you weren't. Funny you should say that. I don't always know myself. <laughs> <laughs> How long will it be before William is out? As soon as possible. Neil will hurry up his reliefs if he can, and I shall see that he does so. You've been terribly kind. Oh, I should say I've been something of a mixture. Take care of that husband of yours in future, and keep him out of bad company. Can I bring him to see you? <laughs> Why not? We could go to the races together. <laughs> Bless you. <laughs> oh, I nearly forgot. I found my earring. If, of course, she ever lost it. <laughs> I don't suppose we shall ever know. Uh, don't go, Tommy. Have you got your papers for the Court of Appeal on Thursday? You've got homework to do. Uh, I shouldn't take long. There are only about a dozen of them. I can't think why they bother to appeal. They're all guilty. Gerald. Oh. Oh, my God. Go away, Tommy. I have work to do. Alibi for a judge starred the late Andrew Cruikshank as Mr Justice Carstairs. Leslie Burford was played by Amanda Grinling and the QC, Thomas Empton, by Aubrey Woods. William Burford was played by Trader Faulkner and the solicitor is the hunt by Jonathan Scott. Mr. Bell, the prosecution counsel, Peter Howell. Superintendent Neal, Michael Shannon. Ernest Mott, Clifford Norgate. Mr. Campbell, Hector Ross. Mrs. Campbell, Carol Boyd. Joe, Michael Burlington. And Inspector Martin, Anthony Smee. Anibai for a Judge was written by Felicity Douglas and Henry Cecil with Basil Dawson and was based on the book by Henry Cecil. It was adapted to radio and directed by John Tideman.